Good evening, everybody, and welcome. This is week two already of BK141. We're going over chocolate this week. My favorite, love chocolate. It's my favorite food. Yes, it's a food. Don't tell me otherwise. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot to go over tonight. And uh, of course, we'll start by going over week one. So before class started, we were talking about all our crazy kiddos at home with all of this craziness going on. Um, just remember that there's no late penalties for anything right now. Everybody is balancing so many schedules. I just want to see you learning. I want you turning in your assignments so that I can look, so that I can help you. Um, don't worry about getting that 15 uh, point penalty. Um, but I do want to see you staying on track because you don't want to like let it snowball and then it's kind of hard to get control over it at that point. So please still make sure you're getting it in on Tuesday nights, 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and then, of course, that late period, which ends uh, tomorrow evening, Thursday at 11.59. That way on Friday, I can kind of clear out whatever is left there and then Monday, you know, get going on uh, looking at the new week two assignments. So that brings us to, I want to go over week one. Who wants to chime in and talk to me about their sugar cookery, their experience, positive, negative? There's no negative. There's learning experiences. I know Jesse. Jesse, you had some honeycomb to talk about. Tell me, tell me. I did. And it was actually, it goes along with the sugar cookery period anyway, because um, my candy thermometer was way off. And I discovered it from making honeycomb when I burnt this it was the worst smell known to man, <laughs> but um, my thermometer said it was 300 degrees, but it was technically probably like 325, 350. Like it just was burnt and awful. And um, so I did the same. I used my candy thermometer again for my cooked sugar, not really thinking it was the um, thermometer issue. I just thought it was, you know, my issue that I had the stove too high or something. But um, yeah, so at the end of my sugar cooking, it started to crystallize because I realized something was definitely wrong with the thermometer. So I went and grabbed my probe thermometer and had to just keep use, dipping that in um, to the syrup in order to get the temperature correct. Yeah. Which it came all, the temperature was fine with the probe thermometer, but it was starting to crystallize at the end of my cooking, if that makes sense. No, yeah, definitely. Because, and that's what happens is when you're agitating it too many times, whether it's with going in and out with a thermometer or when you're taking your spoon as you're dipping it in and getting your sample out, that constant back and forth and going in and out, um, sometimes it can crystallize it. So just being really careful, really delicate as you're going in there with the probe or when you're going in there with the spoon, kind of dipping it in like a ice water just to rinse it out, that's really helpful. Um, Another thing is those stick thermometers, the candy thermometers, honestly speaking, they are not my favorite because like they have to be a certain depth into your sugar syrup to get a real accurate reading. And, you know, you just kind of click it to the end of your pot and sometimes it might not be getting that accurate read on there. Um, so I, I like a probe thermometer. Um, and then, of course, because I've been, you know, kind of checking sugar for a long time, you start to recognize the cues. So let's say it's really fast, really rapid, the bubbles in there, um, you know that it's, it's, there's still a lot of water in there, so you haven't reached that kind of soft ball stage yet. But when your bubbles start to get really lava-like and like gloppy, like, like all on top of each other, that's when you know you're kind of coming up on that like softball stage. So that's when you, especially, you know, we work a lot in softball. When we're making uh, buttercream, so you have to get softball for your meringue before you're pouring it in. Um, when you're making, you know, I just went brain dead, but whatever. <laughs> we work with softball stage a lot. So you start to recognize those stages that you look for. And then when you start to get into caramel, it's not a specific temperature that you start looking for. It's like, okay, I know I want a light amber. I know what that's gonna look like. That's, I'm gonna go straight for that. Or I want a dark amber, so I'm gonna let it go there and then boom, pull it off, you know, shock it in your ice water. So you start to look for those other cues and they really help when your thermometer doesn't want to be friends with you and wants to give you a hard time. Those other, um, those other factors and those other kind of, you know, things there going on that will help you judge um, 
where you're at, you know, what stage you're looking for. But it's happened to the best of us. Trust me. Go ahead. I did order that clip that you suggested mm, yes. you the pot for the probe, but because Amazon's so crazy right now, it has an extended delivery time. So I don't oh. know when it'll be here, but I did order one. <laughs> I did hear that they've hired on so many people that they're going to be able to start shipping non essential items again. Um, so hopefully they'll, that will kind of get fast tracked crossing fingers. Um, I've wanted to order some more chocolate for so long and I'm like, they're not going to bring it to me. <laughs> they're probably like, what do you need chocolate for right now? I'm like I need it. <laughs> but no, um, those clips are super helpful, uh, with the probe thermometer. Something that I like to do with tempering chocolate, which should, I'll go over is I take my probe thermometer and I tape it to my spatula so that it's giving a constant active read. Some of you guys have those fancy thermometers that are like the thermometer and a spatula combined, but I haven't used, I haven't, haven't spent my money on that yet, but I just use my tape. But what, what other experiences did we have with the sugar? I think it's a, a cool experiment. I like to kind of bring the kids in to watch this one because you get to see every single stage all next to each other. And I think that's just the coolest thing ever. And I'm like geeking out over sugar right now. What other experiences did you guys have? Um, oh, I saw Ashley. She said she's like a kid in a candy store. She's like bragging to her husband. And you should. You should be proud of what you're doing. This is hard stuff. Like, it's very technical. You know, if things aren't precise, like, it's crazy. It's crazy in the kitchen. So you definitely, like, give yourself a pat on the back when you're getting this kind of stuff down. Everybody's excited. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. I saw good things. Like, um... I could see all the manipulation of each of the stages. You guys were like, you know, kind of messing with the sugar at the softball stage. I could see that it's squishy, it's pliable. When you get up to a hard crack, it does just that. It's able to snap. Um, I think the only thing that I saw was kind of that crystallization happening towards the end of the process. So I'm thinking by that point, you guys might have over agitated maybe a little bit as you were taking your samples. Um, so just make sure you're working with a clean spoon as you're going in and out of there and then uh, washing down the sides of your pot is really helpful as well. And I keep like asking for other input and then I keep talking. I'm going to stop now. Does anybody else want to talk about their week one? Everybody's chit-chatting in the in the chat box. Let's see. Junior pastry chef stays in the kitchen with you. Oh, the kids, yes, the junior pastry chefs. Yeah, I've got my little ones. They're little like chef hats and their little aprons. <laughs> Not my older one. He's he's too cool for school with all of that. So whatever. 12-year-old boys, what are you gonna do? All right, guys. Well, like I said, we have tons of stuff to go over this week. So let's go ahead and dive on into week two. If you haven't done week one yet, um, get it to me by tomorrow evening. I would love to see it by then. If you need more time, just let me know. I'm happy to help however I can. All right. Uh, week two, we're going to be tempering chocolate this week. Don't get intimidated. Yes, it's a lot to take in, but you guys will do just fine. Um, I want to first, though, a couple years ago, probably... I don't know, maybe three years ago, I was in Orlando. I actually forgot to bring up, I wanted to bring it up for you guys. Uh, there's a chocolate museum in Orlando. Anybody, anybody here living in Florida? No Florida people, I'm the only one. Okay, well, I went to the chocolate museum and it was the coolest thing ever. We like went on, um, kind of like they almost had like a tour like through the history of chocolate and I have pictures so I'm going to show you pictures and we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of chocolate um, as well as chocolate production like how you know it went from cocoa bean to what we know um, today so let's go ahead I, I want to pull up that website <clears throat> for you guys to see let me uh, make that bigger that way you can see it so this is, the, uh, this is the website. Hey guys, make sure you're muted just so that we don't have that feedback in the, um, in the background. So when you go back and watch the video, there's not feedback in there. Um, so it's in Orlando, International Drive, iDrive, that's where it is. 
Um, and it has, like, like I said, it has the museum there and you can like take this kind of tour. It has a little cafe at the end of it where you can get like desserts. How delicious does that look? A nice lava cake. Oh, love it. Um, but yeah, let's pull up these pictures. So it was just the coolest thing ever. So in the beginning, it starts, you know, way back where, you know, chocolate was in Central America and the Mesoamerican region. And this is kind of, it was like the food of the gods back then. It was currency, um, <clears throat> you know, back in the Aztec time, which actually it was, people say that uh, it's the Olmecs who first used kind of the cocoa bean. Uh, a lot of people say that it was like the Mayans and the Aztecs, but it actually goes a little bit further back than that. It goes to the Olmec times. Uh, and then, you know, kind of it goes into the next and the next uh, civilization because all these civilizations, they, they just used to disappear. I don't even know how that happens, how these huge civilizations just are gone. But yeah, so uh, everybody kind of in that Central American region, they would use the cocoa bean. It would be used, like I said, it would be used as medicine, as currency. Um, it was believed to be kind of like the drink of the gods and everything. Uh, this picture here, I like this one because it shows you all the different parts, like all the different stages that the cocoa bean goes through. Uh, so you have your cocoa bean <clears throat> and what happens is the, the I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. The farmers harvest the cocoa beans, right? So it's these big giant kind of pods and they pull them off the trees. And then at that point, they have to, you know, kind of allow it to ferment. They crack the pods open. The cocoa beans are like covered in all of this pulp. It's gooey, it's just gross. So they leave it out on banana leaves and allow that to ferment. Then at that stage, once it's fermented for a couple of days, that's when those beans get cracked. And that's when the cocoa nib, you get the cocoa nib from there. So um, let's jump back into those pictures. And that's what it shows kind of here. We've got the cocoa nibs. Right here's the cocoa in that pulp that I was talking about, and then it goes into the nibs. So this just shows the different stages of it. I thought that was really awesome. Then a little bit more about the history, you know, this guy, Cortez. Let me bring up my guide. That'll be easier, right? So then the Spanish people show up, Christopher Columbus. Uh, they gave him the beans. The Aztecs gave him the beans. He didn't know what it was. He's like, I don't, what am I going to do with this? I don't want this. So, I mean, he took it out of curiosity. But then it wasn't until Cortez showed up that they, um, the Aztecs mistaked him to be a god. And of course, he took advantage of that, kind of wiped out that civilization. But it was really him who took the beans over to Europe. And then that's when uh, the beans just kind of started like, you know, blasting all over Europe. And it was a drink. It became a drink before it ever became um, something that we eat. And they would have really fancy chocolate hot chocolate parties and these are some kind of examples like they almost look like like really fancy tea parties <clears throat> where um the, the cups are a little bit taller than a tea uh but yeah this is some of the stuff that the europeans would drink um the hot chocolate out of so i just wanted to share some of those photos with you i thought that it was really cool it's a very fun experience um Oh, where did my screen go? Hold on, guys. Technical difficulties. Okay, so <laughs> bear with me. I'm the worst. All right, so after those beans are harvesting, they fermented it. They've, you know, pulled the cocoa nibs out of there. They've cleaned it. They've roasted the nibs off. Then it goes through another process where nibs are made from like 50% cocoa powder, cocoa solids, 50% cocoa butter. It goes through a process. It goes through a press, like a hydraulic press. It then that separates the cocoa butter from the cocoa solids. And that's a really important, um, that's a really important stage in kind of chocolate production because what's gonna happen there is it's going to allow the chocolate maker the control to add back that cocoa butter and determine how much cocoa butter they want in the final product. Uh, couverture chocolate, I know you've been hearing that term kind of thrown around a lot so far. Couverture chocolate has to have at least 31% cocoa butter. There cannot be any other type of fat in there, no butter fat. Uh, palm oil, that'll be another one that you see. 
if it has any of those, it doesn't have that curvature tag on there. And curvature is just, I mean, it's high quality, real, true chocolate. And that's what you wanna be working on or working with in this class for this week and next week for tempering. Because it's actually the cocoa butter in there that you're tempering, that you're are pre crystallizing, we like to call it. Because tempering is not only focusing on temperature, but it focuses on a lot of other uh, aspects as well time, agitation. So there are definitely a couple steps. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys, I'm sorry. Hmm. There are a couple things that go along with tempering besides just watching the temperature. Did you have a question, Linda? Uh, no, I was trying to log on to the class on my computer, but it won't, it wouldn't do it. Oh, so uh oh, I had to my phone. Well, I'm glad that you're able to join us from the phone, though. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> crazy times. I don't know. Everything's crazy. Uh -huh. Everybody's on the computer right now. Everybody's on the internet. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But I'm like, okay. wait a I always log on. <laughs> like, what's going on? That's all right. Well, you're here now. Yes. So, back to kind of the uh, production of chocolate real quick. You know, once you've kind of added that cocoa butter back in, that's called conche. And at that time, at that point, um, your chocolate is going through like this grinder. And I don't know, did I have a picture of that? That would be fantastic to show you. I don't think I have that one. But it's going through a grinder <clears throat> and it's just running. It's running for quite some time. And this process, uh, this process allows you to have a really smooth product. Um, so kind of some of the things that influence chocolate, some of the people that influence chocolate, uh, once the hydraulic press was created by a scientist, so, uh, or um, a, what's the word? I'll come back to that. <laughs> so the hydraulic press was created and then um, after that happened, it kind of got into the chocolate world they figured out that they could make this really smooth product. Uh, people started adding sugar to it. Then once the sugar got added to it, things started tasting better. It started becoming more like, hey, we can eat this. Once you add that cup cocoa butter back in, it starts to solidify and then it becomes edible. So that's when it started to shift from being something that you drink to something that you eat. And then um, there was <clears throat> the person who created like dry milk uh, started adding that into the cocoa, uh, into the chocolate, and then that's where milk chocolate was born. Now, kind of at that same time, while all of that was happening over in Switzerland, Switzerland is like reign supreme in milk chocolate. I love Swiss milk chocolate. Uh, Felkland, I'll type it in the chat. I don't think you can get it retail, but Felkland's like my absolute favorite um, chocolate to use. It's a Swiss chocolate. It's just, it's divine. But kind of at the same time, all of that was happening. Milk chocolate is arising um, over on our side of the world in the States. On the West Coast, you start having uh, Ghirardelli popping up. East Coast, Hershey, Pennsylvania. So Hershey's and Ghirardelli starts to pop up in the States all while um, over in Europe as well. Just chocolate is just being eaten everywhere and all over the place, which love it. Love who all the guys who started doing all of that for us. Now jumping into tempering chocolate. I don't, the video that we have this week, it's quite long. I want you guys to watch it on your own time, but I do want to overview the process with you, of course. So the reason that we temper chocolate is because what you're trying to do is you want to, like I said a little while ago, it's the cocoa butter really is what you're working with. And what you wanna do is you want to get it to the point where stable crystals are present. So there are six crystal forms in cocoa butter. What you're looking for is the fifth form or the beta crystals. And the reason this is, is that at that stage, you will have a very stable, your cocoa butter will be stable. It won't be easily meltable. It will have a nice snap to it. So that's what you're going for when you're tempering chocolate. So you, at first, you're gonna start with melting your chocolate, but you don't want to exceed, uh, I believe 115, 115, 120. You don't want to exceed that temperature because you don't wanna damage the cocoa butter. You want to kind of be gentle with it. So you bring it up to that temperature while you're melting it, 
And then what you do is you're going to drop it down in temperature. A couple different ways you can do this. You can use the seeding method where you're going to take, when you receive a bag of chocolate, it's tempered already. So what you're doing with the seeding method is you're adding that good seed. You're adding that tempered chocolate to help bring down the temperature as well as introduce stable crystals. So you're adding that untempered chocolate to the melted chocolate that you've gotten to your specific temperature, which I have guidelines of those temperatures for you. And that brings down the temperature, adds those stable crystals in. And then by that time, you've brought it down to the temperature where those beta crystals that we're looking for are most prevalent at that temperature. And then you knock it back up just a little bit so that it is at a working consistency because the temperature that you've cooled it all the way down to, it's gonna be pretty thick, gonna be pretty kind of gloppy. So you wanna be able to bring it back up to temperature, that way you can work with it. So if you're looking at it, it's like, well, what's the point of this? Why am I going up and down just to go back up again? I get it, I've been there. It took me a little while to like grasp why it was happening because at first it just seems kind of silly. And I'm right there with you, I totally get it, I was there. But that's why you have to heat it, but gently, because you don't want to burn your cocoa butter, you have to drop it down to get those stable crystals, and then you got to bring it back up to work with it. So that's the reason for the up and down. That's what you're doing. That's what you're going for. Now, it does vary a little bit whether you're working with dark milk or white chocolate. Who can tell me why dark chocolate and milk chocolate are different from each other. Or white, milk and white, why are those different from dark chocolate? Any guess? You could be wrong. The chocolate that's in it? The dark it is. Butter? The we, we heard cocoa butter, we heard chocolate, the type of chocolate. Uh, in the chat though, I see milk solids. Ding, 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 ding. Ashley's got milk solids. So that's what's happening in milk chocolate and white chocolate. The sugar content is higher and the cocoa butter, or sorry, the uh, milk solids, we've got milk solids prevalent now. So with dark chocolate, there's absolutely no milk solids. It's just sugar. And then depending on, I heard sugar, somebody mentioned that, depending on how much sugar is going to determine, do you have a semi-sweet dark? Do you have a bittersweet? Or do you have an extra bittersweet? So the higher that percentage is for a dark chocolate, that means the less sugar is in there and it's just cocoa solids and cocoa butter. But then when you start looking at your milk chocolates and your white, which white curvature actually is not considered chocolate because there are no uh, solids. There's no cocoa solids in a white chocolate. It's just cocoa butter and sugar. Um, so milk chocolate and dark chocolate both have the cocoa solids. And to be considered a chocolate, it does need to have all of those. It has to have cocoa butter and it has to have cocoa solids. Uh, white chocolate doesn't have the solids. So the differences that you'll see here is when you're melting it down, you're gonna be a little bit more aggressive with the heat on the dark chocolate because there's no milk solids present. So you don't have to worry about the milk solids burning, whereas the milk chocolate and of course the white, it's, it's very important to make sure you're not burning those milk solids. Um, when you get into tempering, I personally like to suggest working with dark chocolate first. You can work with any of them perfectly fine. You guys have got this, I know you do, but dark chocolate is just a little bit easier to work with, I would say because it doesn't have the extra elements of like the milk solids in there and things like that. Um, so when so you're- now, what, what, what would be the best percentage since we just started off? What would be the best percentage you recommend? Oh, I mean, any, anything in the, like anything in the dark chocolate realm, that's it's just gonna be the easiest, that's all. So anything from like, you're probably looking at 55 to kind of 70 would be yeah. like a tasty dark chocolate. If you like a more intense, like 80, 85, go for it. But <laughs> I just know that some people don't care to go that dark. So stick in your like 55s, that'll be a nice semi-sweet up until like your 70s would be a pretty bittersweet one. Um, you're going to be in your 30s for your milk chocolate. And then of course you're in like your 20% in the white chocolate. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Did you use ruby chocolate? You could use ruby chocolate. I have not got my hands on it yet. So I would absolutely love for you to work with that. That you would work uh, with ruby chocolate. You could stick in the milk chocolate range, 
I think okay. you would be safe in the milk chocolate. Have you gotten the ruby? No, I just have seen and been doing a lot of research between this week and next week's assignments and just trying to figure out what I want to do. So I bought dark chocolate, but I've seen a lot of about the new ruby chocolate. Right on. Yeah. So let's chit chat about that real quick. Ooh, let me bring up. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. Ruby chocolate is really, really cool. It's like a legit pink. It's, it's pink, the cocoa bean. Um, let me bring that up so we can see some images of it. Um, I want to see if I can find like the bean itself. Let me share this. You guys will get to know that I bounce around a lot <laughs> when you guys get me excited for something. It's like, oh, let's go talk about that. Um, so these are, they even came out with uh, ice cream bars. I definitely want to try those. But the bean, well, that's just a pink Kit Kat on top of there. That's a terrible picture. <laughs> but it's, it's legit pink chocolate. And it's really cool. Um, Valrhona, I believe, was probably the first to start selling it, if I'm not mistaken. They're kind of the first to bring it out for everybody to see. Uh, but the beans itself, they are definitely, like, they produce pink chocolate. It has not been dyed. Here it is in its block form. So that's what it looks like once it's gone through the whole chocolate production. You've, you know, um, expelled it, the cocoa butter from the solids, brought it back together with your conching process. And this is what comes out of it. You get this really beautiful, just gorgeous ruby chocolate. So if you get your hands on that, Sarah, send me pictures if you're working with it. I would love to see that. That's really cool. Um, oh, guidelines, temperature guidelines. So let's jump back over there so you guys can see that. <clears throat> All right, so your dark chocolate, you're gonna melt it to about 115 to 120. You wanna stay in that range. But if it goes over that, you need to allow it to cool back down um, because like I said, you don't want to burn your chocolate. I mean, if it flies over that, your chocolate at that point has probably gonna end up getting burnt and it will seize. So if when you're melting, if you notice that it kind of, your chocolate starts to solidify, it's seized. Either you got water in there or uh, you got it too hot. So you're setting it up in a bain marie. Put your chocolate in there. Whatever your measurement is, my suggestion would be kind of split it into two thirds, one third. So two thirds of your chocolate, you're going to put it over your bain marie. The other one third, you're going to seed that in to bring down the temperature. So you're gonna melt it up to the 115. Uh, as you're cooling it, you wanna bring it down to this cooling temperature. Now, when you do start to melt it, just kind of leave it on your bain marie, just let it do its thing, let it start melting. When you start to see the edge of the bowl melted, then you can start agitating it. Chocolate likes to be agitated because you need to disperse those crystals. You need to disperse them throughout, that way you get a nice even melt, as well as um, you're dispersing the temperature uh, so that no spots of it burn. Um, real quick before I keep going, I saw a couple questions in here about the chocolate. Um, I see Baker's brand as well as Guitar. Um, for the seeding method, do I still chop the chocolate or the curvature wafers small enough? Curvature wafers are definitely small enough. You don't have to chop those up. But if you have the block, you'll want to go ahead and chop that up. Um, take your knife and work on the corners. Don't just kind of slice through it. So let's say you have your block of chocolate here because you want to, you don't want to destroy your knife. So go on the corner of it and just wobble back and forth until it, it's, it'll start to shred itself down and then just go on another corner and do the same thing. That way it kind of cuts down into shreds instead of um, like big chunks of it and that will help to melt it down. Um, so once you have your two thirds on your Ben Marie, that's melted, you see the outside getting melted down, um, and then you can go ahead and start agitating it to melt the entire mass down. Pull it off of the heat, and that's when you're going to start to cool it. So you're gonna start seeding in those, that extra chocolate that you have on the, si on the side. Um, is that the same with the bars? Those like the thin bars, you can kind of like snap those up, and then you can just take a knife and rough chop the thin ones, but if you have like the big block, that's the one where you wanna just kind of like shimmy down the corners, that way you don't destroy your knife. Uh, so then you start to seed in your other third of chocolate that you had set to the side. This is gonna drop down the temperature as well as introduce the, um, those stable crystals that are already prevalent in the chocolate. 
Once you do this, you want to keep monitoring the temperature to make sure that you've brought it down to that specific cooling temperature, which with dark chocolate, it was kind of that 80 to 84 zone. Um, at this point, if you are finding it hard to melt down that extra chocolate that you had to the side and you still haven't reached that cooling, you can pop it on in like 10 second increments to your Ben Marie just to encourage the rest of that seed to melt down. Um, but if you got it past the 115, if it went higher than the original, or if it went back to the original um, melting temperature, you gotta start all over again. That's why I said just kind of like 10 second spurts if you're having a hard time getting all of that chocolate melted down, like that extra third that you're adding in to bring down the temperature. If you're having trouble with that melting all the way down, just kind of pop it on the Ben Marie, just give it a little stir, pull it back off, and that will just help to decrease the temperature. Um, airflow is really helpful. So when you pull it off of the, of the stove, there's gonna be water. You're gonna wanna set it on a tea towel just to make sure that it's not you know, wet. Water and chocolate are not friends. But when you start to cool it down, I like to use either a cake, um, a cake ring. If you don't have one of those, if you have a spring form pan, just the ring part of it, and you can set your bowl right on that. And it helps air to flow under there. Uh, that way that cooling process does move a little bit quickly. Um, then once it's reached your desired cooling temperature, that's when you're gonna go back onto the Ben Marie. It happens really quickly. Give it a stir on that Ben Marie, bring it back up to working temperature. With uh, dark chocolate, you're looking for about like 89, and then that's when you're ready to work with it. So that's the process, melting it down, seeding in your chocolate, letting it cool, and then bring it back up to working temperature. Now that's the seeding process. If you, does anybody have any questions on that? I wanna kind of briefly go over the table, or like if you're using a marble slab, but who has questions about the seeding um, method? So all the extra third will be melted or will you not utilize all of the, the last third? You will. So I think we're using 500 grams of chocolate this week. I want, let's see. Yes, Kathy, I will put the temperatures on the class page for you. They are in the book, but just so that you don't have to go search for it, I'm gonna put those there. Um, I am, it's not on the class page, the amount, so 500 grams. You're gonna wanna melt down 500 grams of chocolate. So somebody do the math quick for me. I'm a pastry chef and math in my head is not my friend. Calculator. <laughs> I'm the worst, guys. So about okay. 167 grams. Yes, ma'am. Leave that off to the side and melt down your two thirds, and that all of the rest of it will get added back in there. Okay. Um, and then you just keep stirring it, keep agitating it. If it hasn't reached that temperature that you want, by adding in that seed, if it's still a little bit too hot, just be patient with it. Keep stirring it. Allow it to just keep falling. Uh, in temperature. And then once it's hit your desired temperature, boom, back on the Ben Marie, bring it back up to temp. And then that's when you're ready to work with it. Um, if you're doing the marbling method, what you would do is you can follow that same process up into the point where you've added the seed in and then put it on the marble slab to finish cooling it down. Or you can melt your entire amount of chocolate, say the entire 500 grams, you would put, you would take that up to your 115. And then that would then get poured onto your mar marble slab. And with like a spatula, or I use like a, uh, you know, those painter knives, those like stucco knives, the big like wide ones where you can, you can use that and just all over your countertop, all over your marble slab, that will bring it down in temperature. And then at that point, you would then scrape it all up warm it back up over a Ben Marie and boom, you're ready to go. So that is another, uh, another method that is the more kind of traditional. That's what people were doing first was on the table. Um, another one, but wait, there's more, uh, a microwave method. Some people will do the microwave method. I, it's not my favorite method. I like seeding. I think that's the, probably the easiest one to do at home, but with the microwave, because microwaves, um, melt from or cook from the inside out versus outside in 
the thought process behind using the microwave is that you are melting the chocolate and never exceeding your working temperature. So all you have to do in like 30 second increments, you can burst it in 30 second increments and pull it out, stir it down, uh, pop it in again, and it should never exceed the working temperature. So it should never go past that like 88, 89, and that's the microwave method. So it's quick, it's easy, um, but if you go over that working temp, that 88, 89, you have to start again, you have to scrap that. Uh, let's see, specific size of marble board for chocolate work, um, just enough, uh, large enough to be able to pour out that much. So, I mean, probably like a, a two by two foot would probably be a good size, I would say. I mean, that's a little bit small, you could only work with like small batch there. But like if, when you're working in a chocolate shop, like the entire tabletop is going to be marble. So you can just like, you know, chocolate in all its glory, just pouring all everywhere all over the place. <laughs> Once you guys get comfortable working with chocolate and it's not so messy, um, you're gonna fall in love. Like in the beginning, you're gonna probably feel a little bit like, oh man, chef, this is making a lot of mess. Like I'm getting stressed out. Don't get stressed, embrace the mess. You're gonna get chocolate on you. That's what aprons are for. Uh, but as you get more comfortable with the whole process, I promise you'll start to work a lot cleaner and then you will grow the love that I have for chocolate. Uh, so in addition to tempering your chocolate, I would also like to see you make a paper cornet or a cornet or paper, parchment paper piping bag. Has anybody made one of those at this point? No? Well, I've got a video for that. Maybe. There we go. They, at first, they take a second to like get it, like how to make it. But once you make it a couple times, you'll love it. At least I do. I used to be the parchment paper girl in the kitchen. Like I would just make a bunch of them and they would just be there and you can just grab them and use them. So she's taken a rectangle about like a, like a 12 by seven and she is, see how she's folded in half. Then once you can cut it or use scissors, whatever you're comfortable with. I want her to get to this part. So I'm going to pause it here. <clears throat> see that like weird flat side? I call that, this reminds me of like a, a shark fin. This is how I learned in pastry school and that's what I've always remembered. So that flat side that she's working with there, I call that the ugly fin. And the ugly fin always turns in. So always remember that, ugly fin in. So that will make sense as I go further through the video. This will also be in uh, class announcements on the class page for you guys to browse at your leisure. So she's got her flat side. And then you've got the angled side and the point here, the point that's above your flat side. You're going to take this to meet this and then continue to roll it over. So watch her. This, where her finger is right now, that ends up being your point. That ends up being your tip. So ugly fin in. And then you can just kind of hold that there. And then she's going to continue to wrap the rest around and it will meet up there as well. See how it's kind of just in the middle? Well, she kind of brushes over that. Let me rewind that real quick. That way I can show you guys how to get it up. Oh, this thing's quick. <laughs> okay, so you see right here how she is just kind of in the middle. It's like, well, how do I get it all the way up here, chef? You're gonna just pull it. You just take that and you just like force it up. You just kind of pull it up this way and you just zhuzh it around a little bit and it will, it will meet up at the top. So once she has it up there, you can kind of just like fold the points. All the points will meet together, fold it down and that locks it in place. So that's what she's doing here. We won't watch the rest. She talks a lot but it's a good video to watch. I just wanted you guys to kind of like get the gist of making that. So once you have made that, 
then I would like for you to do some piping. We're gonna make your own decor. I know a couple of you were asking about stencils. You will be making your own stencils. Uh, fill up your bag. You can tape it as well. Thank you, Kathy. You can definitely tape it, um, but if you don't have tape on hand, just fold it over and that will hold it in place. When you are filling it, fill it like maybe a third to a half, no more than that. If it's too full, it, all your chocolate is going to burst out the back. So you don't want that. Less mess. So you want to fill it no more than halfway. And then you can kind of fold it down to hold your chocolate in there. And then just snip a little bit of the tip off. You don't need a wide opening because uh, chocolate is very fluid. If you've not piped with chocolate yet, it's far more fluid than buttercream, of course. It's far more fluid than royal icing. So you want a, just a tiny little hole at the tip of your parchment um, little parchment bag, your cornet. And on a piece of parchment paper, I would like for you to do some stencil work. So I brought up a couple like examples of some things that you could be piping out. Um, I actually, fun, fun. So I started getting into culinary in high school. Um, the culinary arts school that I went to was a, it was a, it was a regular high school, but it had like the culinary arts program there. Um, and then I switched from that school and I went to another one where I started getting into like competitions and I was the pastry girl on the team. Um, it was just a lot of fun, but I found a newspaper clipping. I wanted to put it in Google Drive. Can you see it? That's that's 16 year old Chef Sinead piping out <laughs> her school name over and over again. I thought you guys would like to see that. I'll put that like a link to that. But yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that you guys are going to be doing. You're going to be piping out um, words or, you know, there's on the on the class page is a video showing you some options that you have and kind of how to. So definitely watch those resources. But these are the kind of things that you're kind of looking for. Um, and they work great for going on top of pentafors, on top of cupcakes. Uh, you can kind of use them for like any kind of decoration. Uh, this one here is one of my favorites. We have like a honeycomb theme going in this class. Oh, didn't mean to close that. Uh, you pour your chocolate over your bubble wrap. That one's on the class page as well. And it's so cool. It looks like little kind of honeycomb pieces. You can use it on like plated desserts. Um, so it just adds a really nice element, a really nice kind of extra touch, if you will. Here's some other ones that you can you can make. Those ones look store-bought. Those don't look hand-piped. Um, look, we've got some like little Christmas trees. So yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to want to pipe out uh, on your parchment paper and then as it cools, because if your chocolate is tempered properly, it will cool within three to five minutes. It will set within three to five minutes and chocolate shrinks when it cools. So it will release itself from the parchment and you'll be easily be able to just kind of pop it off the parchment, set it on a plate, take a picture of that and send me that. That'll be one of your photos. So tempering chocolate, making your cornet, and making me some stencils. Those are the three things that I'm going to be looking for this week. Ah, breathe. So like I said, lots to go over this week. Who has questions? Is anybody wanting to ask a question now on anything that we've gone over thus far? Jeff, I have one. Um, yeah. I missed the part of what you tend to use for the marble slab. Can oh, I yeah. That spatula thing that is kind of like the cake spatula. Mm, you can use the cake spatula or I think it's called a painter's spatula. It's probably not what it's called, but maybe Google will know what I'm talking about. Um, all right. So like one of these, these guys, these types of tools, putty knife. That's a better word. There we go. <laughs> so we can use those. Those are fine. Those work. Something, you know, something like three, four inches wide would be fine. Um, anything in that realm will work. Or like I said, you can use your, like an offset spat. That's fine as well. That will work also. Great question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How do we make the stencils? So Kathy, there are some uh, videos on the class page. There's like four videos on there that I definitely want you guys to browse through. Um, there is chocolate garnishes. That's going to be the video that you want to look at. But what you're like, there's so many different types that you can make. So watch that video on there. What else? There's um, 
of course, the tempering chocolate video, the chocolate garnishes video, and then watch that fun facts about chocolate. There's like 30 fun facts about chocolate there. Um, and it just kind of, you know, if you're really into this stuff, there's those, those resources there. Um, that way you can see how to make all kinds of different types of stencils. Anybody else have any questions? Well, a little bit real quick for, um, for next week. Oh, Kathy was asking, you don't have to do marble. So you can just do the seating method. And that's when you're, that's the one that I was kind of talking about for the most part. And that's what your, your video will be on the class page when you watch that video so that you can get that visual is you're just melting down the two thirds and your Ben Marie. And then you're pulling that off. Whole thing happens in the bowl. You add your other third to drop your temperature and then bring it back up. So you never touch a marble slab with that. Um, the slab was just if you wanted to, if you wanted to use that. So next week, real quick, if you guys are wanting, we, we're doing rolled truffles next week, so you do not need a mold. But I know that a lot of people have been asking about the molds. Um, so I want to show you kind of the type of mold that you would be using <clears throat> uh, in a pastry shop or in a, a chocolate shop. They're called polycarbonate molds. So it's a little bit different than the silicone ones. The polycarbonate is going to be hard. It's going to give your chocolate like the most amazing gloss, the most amazing shine. Um, so I wanted to pull that up on Amazon just so that you can kind of see those and get an idea of that if it was something, like I said, I don't know how long Amazon is taking these days, but this is what the polycarbonate mold looks like. So next week we'll talk about how to make, you know, bonbons, how to make and fill them. But again, this is not re a requirement. You do not have to have a mold for next week because we are just doing the rolled truffles, which you can do by hand, either rolled or cut. Uh, but polycarbonate chocolate mold, you can search it um, on Amazon and that will bring up all kinds of different shapes. This one's cool. I like this one a lot. But yeah, so that's what you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I think Jesse has a question as well. Yeah, Jesse, go ahead, unmute. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Um, I, I have a couple of molds and they're small chocolate molds. I, my grandmother gave them to my kids. They're just little like plastic things. I don't know if that's something that can be used without, from a reading it said you needed, um, was it cocoa butter to like, on, to grease them, I guess, to get them out of the mold. Does that make sense? No, I got you. So the cocoa butter is your cocoa butter colors. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to like spray them down with cocoa butter or anything, but the type of color that you're going to want to use, if you want to fancy them up and make them pretty, <clears throat> it would need to be cocoa butter based. It can't be alcohol based, can't be water based. So that's the reference to the cocoa butter. So, okay. Yeah. So I just didn't know if I needed it to unmold it. You know, I didn't, wasn't sure if it was a you know, like a greasing type of thing, or if it yeah. was just, okay, thank you. You can, yeah, definitely. And like the silicone ones, you can fill them, like you can make the bonbons, like filled bonbons, but they're a lot better for just kind of solid chocolate. Like if you fill them up with like all the way chocolate and let those set it, because they are so flexible, it's a bit hard to go through the whole process of lining it with the chocolate, filling them, capping them off when you're working with the flexi molds, but it's doable, definitely doable. Uh, plastic candy molds, you can use those as well. Again, kind of same concept because they're not as stable and as sturdy as your polycarbonates. Going through like the lining and the filling process is a little tricky, but you can totally like fill them up with chocolate and make all kinds of cool little, little knickknacks. I'm sorry if I can't like see you guys. I can't see my whole like strip of students. I feel bad, I didn't mean to miss you, Jesse definitely a fun thing to do. Yeah, kids kids kind of like freak out about this kind of stuff, don't they? Um, so this week we have another discussion forum, a knowledge check, conversion check, and your assignment for the week. Please, 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 after, you know, you've watched all your videos on the class page, you've rewatched my lovely face in class, reach out and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I know it's a lot to go over and um, just kind of so that you guys know, again, um, my 
office hours because I want to make sure that you're reaching out and you're able to get me. Uh, so here on the class page, Monday, Thursday, 9 to 6. These are all central times. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, 11 to 8, and Friday, 8 to 12. I cut out early on Fridays. So make sure you're reaching out in those office hours. That way I can help you guys with whatever you may need. So if there is nothing else tonight, nobody else has questions right now, you can always message me after class or whatever tomorrow. You're welcome. It's been so much fun. I love chocolate. I'm so excited to see your guys' work. And thank you for joining me. If you're watching the archive, make sure you had all your questions jotted down and reach out to me and ask whatever questions you have. All right. Have a great night, guys.